I recently picked up a 15 year old NAS from Acer, and while it technically works, it doesn't perform all that well, at least by today's standards. However, one helpful aspect of its design is the use of relatively standard components. Because of that, I'm going to try to modernize this old system with some new parts, and see if we can transform it into a sleeper home server of sorts. And who knows, this might even turn out to be easier than I expect. And that's not a good sign. Poop. This is the Acer Aspire Easy Store H340. If you missed my last video, you should maybe watch it by clicking a card or down in the description or somewhere. But in that video, I took a look at this and found that while it's kind of a cool system, it's pretty old, slow, and inefficient. But the design is pretty interesting. It has four removable drive bays, and on the inside, there's pretty much a standard power supply as well as a mini ITX motherboard, and there's even room for a PCIe slot. So while making that previous video, I couldn't help but think that this could be turned into, well, almost a cool sleeper build where you could upgrade the motherboard, add some extra networking, and just sort of overhaul the internals of this to make it actually usable in 2024. So that's exactly what I plan to do today. Now to do that, we're obviously going to need some hardware, and so that's where this comes in. This is the ASRock N100DC ITX, an ITX motherboard that features, well, the N100 CPU. While it is a cool motherboard, it definitely comes with some downsides. One problem with this motherboard, or more so the N100 CPU, is that it only supports single channel memory, so there's only one DIMM socket. For that, I picked up one of these Corsair Vengeance 32GB DDR4 modules, which I believe is rated up to 3200 mega transfers per second. Because of the PCIe limitations of the N100, this motherboard really isn't that great as a NAS motherboard. To be able to have an NVMe SSD, a Wi-Fi slot, and a PCIe slot, you're only left with enough PCIe lanes for a controller for two SATA ports. And well, obviously we need four. Now this does have room for one M.2 NVMe SSD, which if we wanted to, we could swap that out with something like this little SATA adapter here. But it also has an M.2 E key slot for Wi-Fi. So my plan there is to add this little two SATA port adapter to give us a total of four SATA ports, which means we should hopefully still have room for an M.2 SSD. We also have that PCIe slot to play with, and while we could go with something like an SFP Plus card for 10 gig networking, that might get a little hot in this chassis without some modifications for cooling. So instead, I'm going to go with something a bit more practical and just throw in a two and a half gigabit adapter instead. At least, that's the plan. That pretty much covers all of the hardware, but before we can just start chucking everything in here, we are going to need to do a couple of things. First of all, I wanna take this apart and actually get it cleaned up because I didn't do that in the previous video, but I also need to fix this massive dent in the back to be able to actually use the PCIe slot. So let's get going. Getting the system disassembled was fairly easy, although thanks to the bent case, the IO shield took a bit more finesse to get off. I also messed up filming removing the backplane, but you can see here that it's a fairly simple design with just four SATA ports and a few connectors at the top. One of them is just to power the system fan, the other is a proprietary connector that I hope we won't need, and the last is for power, which we'll tackle here in a bit. To get the dent out, I used some boards to prop up the case in a variety of positions and solely worked out the dent until it seemed decent enough. Once that was done, I dusted off all the components, wiped them down with isopropyl alcohol, and then started reassembling everything. Once again, assembling everything was actually pretty easy, except for trying to plug in all of the SATA cables. That was kind of a pain in the butt. The 2.5 gig card fit with no issues, and while the old fan worked just fine, I decided to swap it out with a much cleaner and probably quieter fan from Arctic, and then plugged it into the motherboard. Oh yeah, I also got to do this. Finally, I reattached the front panel, screwed on the top cover, and then wiped everything down. And our sleeper NAS was looking pretty good.
All right, so it's day two of this project. I got the motherboard in, everything cleaned up, and it's looking pretty good, but we do still have a couple of big problems. First of all, I think I forgot to mention this, but the motherboard actually uses a 19 volt barrel jack for power rather than standard ATX power connections. That's great because it means we technically don't need this power supply up here, which gives us some more room, but it also means we don't have an easy way to actually power the backplane, which uses two Molex connections. We'll get to that in a bit. The other problem we have is that this front panel uses some proprietary connectors, not the standard front panel connectors you'd get on a normal PC case. So as of right now, we won't have a working power button or any of these LEDs or the USB 2 ports. There's also these LEDs for the individual drives, which I kind of realistically don't think we'll be able to get working in any sort of useful way, but I do want to get at least the power button and the power button LED as well as the drive LED working, because those should be fairly simple as long as I can ring out which wires are which, and then hook those up to the headers on the motherboard. If I really wanted to, I could probably try to get this USB port working, but it's just a USB 2 port, so it's really not that important in my mind. So I think I'm just gonna hold off on that and just focus on trying to get the power button, power LED, and this hard drive indicator LED working. So those are the two problems I know I need to tackle. I'm sure I'll run into some more here in a bit. But uh, yeah, I think I'm going to get started with the front panel because I think that's going to be a little bit easier. And then I'll move on to the power where I'm probably going to have to make a custom cable, but we'll get to that here in a minute. Now from some earlier testing in my last video, I actually know which one of these cables is for the power button, but I'm going to have to figure out the LEDs. And so I think I'm going to take off this little metal piece here and see if I can't get access to the actual um, PCB. hours later. Okay, well that took way longer than I was hoping it would. In the end, this little PCB was a little bit more complex than I was expecting. I really thought most of the control was going to be done from the motherboard side, and there was really just going to be some simple resistors and LEDs soldered on here, but it's a little bit more complex than that, a little bit above my level of understanding when it comes to electronics because I'm very much a novice, but I at least was able to track down the power button and also another button which was down below, which was for like the USB um, backup function, I believe, something like that. And I was able to at least pin out both of those. And so I think I have enough headers that we should be able to hook this up and at least have both power and reset functionality. We just won't have any LEDs because there, there actually was, I, I found the 3.3 volt header which basically ran the power button up at the very top, but it seems like this has a little bit of multi-functionality. I'm not really sure. It wasn't just a straight like 3.3 volts and ground. So I tried running that 3.3 volts to one of the other LEDs that I thought I pinned out and that didn't quite work and I just didn't want to risk any magic smoke or anything like that. So I just decided I'm going to stick with just the power buttons and uh, this will be like a super sleeper build because it'll just look like it's off all the time which is a little bit sad, but it's what I'm able to do and I already wasted probably a good hour and a half, maybe two hours trying to figure this out and I don't have enough time to keep diving into it. So we're gonna move on. First, let's go ahead and test and make sure that this front panel will work with our new system. It'll also give us a chance to make sure the new system even posts and then we'll move on to figuring out power for the back plane. So let's test out this panel with the motherboard. Okay, so I've got it all plugged up doing a old school, just poke it with a screwdriver test that the system posts. Well, the fan kicked on. Okay, so at least the system turns on. Let's see if we can hook up our front panel and get power and reset working. We'll start just with power first. Let's see. Okay, cool. And it turns it back on. Took up a reset now. Oh, plugged into the wrong one. Okay, reset. There we go. And then power. Cool, so our front panel works at least for power and reset. Let's move on to figuring out how we're going to actually get power to this SATA backplane. So like I mentioned earlier, this motherboard does have those two SATA ports and because it's powered just from a barrel jack, it has a little adapter for two SATA power connections. I imagine I could go an easier route and find some SATA to Molex adapters, but I kind of forgot that I would need those and didn't order them in time to make this video. So I'm going to do the next best thing I can, which is just to make a custom cable. 
I don't really want to sacrifice this because it's the only adapter I have for this motherboard, but I happen to have a bunch of these Zima board adapters, and I found that this cable actually matches up with this motherboard and has the four cables I need. So I should be able to snip this off and then wire that up to this Molex uh, cable from a Corsair power supply to make um, a probably not so safe adapter. This might be a fire hazard, but it's pretty common on this channel. And I'm not really going to be running this thing long term. Don't do this on your own setup. It's probably not advised, but uh, yeah, I'm going to figure out the pinouts and get to snipping and soldering. Let's go. So not the most sophisticated job, probably a mild fire hazard, but it's what I have today. I've already plugged this in and tested the voltages to make sure I spliced everything correctly. So I think now it's time to throw some drives in this thing and uh, see if it works. All right, so this is the one terabyte drive that actually came with the system because, well, if I kill a drive, I'd rather kill this one than one of the four terabyte drives I use for testing. So here goes nothing. Okay. It's plugged in, powering the motherboard on. Okay, we have fan spin. Uh-oh. Well, this isn't good. I'm gonna try a different hard drive just to make sure this one wasn't completely dead, um, which is possible, I guess. So I'm gonna go grab a known working hard drive. What I'm nervous about right now is that uh, that other connector on the back plane was actually for some sort of control, maybe to make the, the drives spin up. Yeah, I really thought it was just going to be a really simple back plane with like power and SATA pass through essentially, but it might not be. Let's let's test another drive really quick before I start getting too too nervous about this one. All right, known working drive here. Plug it in. Power the system on. And that's not a good sign. Poop. Okay, so it seems not all hope is lost. I had avoided looking up anything on this system really just because I wanted it to be kind of a fun project, but after this didn't work, I decided it would be smart to look up what other people have done in the past. And it turns out people have gotten this thing to work, but that one proprietary cable that went to the back plane uh, is sort of necessary. Not entirely, but it did partially control powering on these SATA ports. Um, I think they're in banks of two, so there's two pins on here that uh, need five volts to basically sense that these need to turn on. Uh, but there's apparently also a PWN control header, I think, based off some schematics I found, that possibly provides five volts, and it seems from some comments you could just short those pins. So I'm going to power this thing off, and then I'm going to try, it's going to be really hard to see, but I'm going to try shorting two of these pins. It should be pins seven and nine. Well, that's not quite working. Let's see if I can just jump it with this for now. Okay. I believe that should be right. <laughs> okay, this is a mess. I'm just going to very awkwardly hold it like this and see if this actually powers on. It's possible we're in the wrong slot here because I think we need both of these shorted. But I'm just going to try one and see what happens. Nothing there. I'm going to try plugging into a different spot. Nothing there. Going balls to the wall here. Nope, that's a bad idea. Um, okay, so I think I had the wrong pin. Okay, let me see if I can do this with a jumper now <laughs> instead of a box cutter. Yeah, okay. Let's figure out a way to make this always work. And take this metal plate off, which has a billion screws apparently. I thought this was going to be like kind of a short, easy project. Nope. I think the easiest way to do this is going to literally be just putting a solder blob back here. But it's going to be these three metal pins. Because this, I believe, is pin nine, and then eight and seven. And I just need to jump all of them. Ooh, that worked out really well. One more. I could do this 
more so the right way and use some wire. Scratch that, I have no idea where any of my wire went. Okay, this is super janky. I actually just snipped off a little pin from one of these DuPont wires and uh, soldered that across all three pins. But it should be out of the way of this metal piece and uh, should work. So let's put this all together and test it. Here goes nothing. Okay, system booted. This drive spun up. Let's try it in a different slot. That spun up as well. Ah, thank you people on the internet. Let's get this thing back together. Let's try to make this NAS finally actually work. All right, so I've got everything put together. It's not pretty just yet because I want to be able to make sure I have stuff plugged in in the right spot. But I have the motherboard back in, all the cables wired up, and I put in four of these four terabyte drives. Hopefully I don't kill them or set anything on fire. I feel like there's only one good way to find out. So here's the power cord, and then we should have a power button now. I hear drive spinning up. Nothing's on fire. Forgot to plug in the HDMI core. So we actually should be able to reset it with this button. Sweet. Okay, cool. So you guys can't see probably because I don't have screen capture going because I'm also recording this camera up here. We have two SATA drives here and then the M.2. Other two SATA drives aren't showing up and I'm not sure if that's just because this BIOS doesn't recognize, it doesn't have room for ports that normally wouldn't exist or if that slot's not working. So we're gonna have to get into an operating system to see. I think we're good. I think I'm going to go ahead and get an operating system installed and um, go from there. Okay, so sadly I was wrong when looking up some stuff on this motherboard. For some reason, I felt like I had come across a post where someone had used the ASRock N100 ITX DC or whatever it's called uh, with the M.2 E key slot with like a Coral TPU or something like that. But I guess I was mistaken because it seems like that slot only supports the CNVI for Wi-Fi, which sort of makes sense because the N100 has very few PCIe lanes. So if you're going to be using a CNVI card, there's no reason to waste a PCIe lane on that slot. But it kind of sucks. So since everything else seems to be working, I'm going to go ahead and swap out the M.2 NVMe SSD with this six port SATA adapter. So I can add the other two hard drives to this. And then I think I'm just going to boot this up with Unraid because I think that makes a lot of sense. And while I could use a SATA PCIe card, I don't want to give up my networking. So I think I'm going to... So I think I'm going to drop this in, run with Unraid since I do have USB 3 on the back. And uh, we'll go with that. So yeah, I'm gonna get this swapped out really quick. And then I'm gonna put this all back together. We're gonna run Unraid and hopefully have a cool little sleeper NAS that hopefully won't catch on fire. After swapping to the other M.2 SATA adapter, I was able to get Unraid working with no issues. All four drives were recognized and I set up an array with a single parity drive. Once the parity sync was finished, it worked perfectly as a simple NAS. I also installed Jellyfin and that worked great as well, even with hardware accelerated transcoding. Even after turning up the fan curve to performance, the system was nearly inaudible while also keeping the drive temps in check. Power draw was better than before, with total system power consumption now down to between 33 and 34 watts. That's not a massive improvement sadly, but it is hard to go substantially lower with four hard drives. If I unplugged the back plane entirely and removed the 2.5 gig card, the power draw dropped to around 16 watts. One thing to note is that while this system has a backplane and removable caddies, it might not necessarily support hot swapping drives. Even after enabling hot swap in the BIOS for the two SATA ports on the motherboard, it didn't seem to work correctly in Unraid for any four of the drives. Just something to keep in mind. While the N100 isn't an incredibly powerful CPU by any means, you could still do a lot with this little NAS slash home server. Way more than could be done with the nearly decade old Atom that was in here before. And I think the overall aesthetic is pretty slick looking. Now I wouldn't go out of my way to pick one of these up, but if you stumble across one being thrown out or sold for next to nothing, it could make for a fun home server project. While this video was a massive pain in the butt at times, I still had a good time making it, and I hope you enjoyed watching it as well. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching, stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.